very good day to you and thank you for joining us for today's RSIS webinar hosted by the Center for Multilateralism Studies. Um, uh, we are um, pleased to introduce you to today's topic, which is uh, 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 digital diplomacy after the pandemic. Uh, uh, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. Um, and we have uh, today uh, two very uh, fine, um, distinguished um, scholars of uh, the uh, digital diplomacy. And um, I would just like to um, make a few house housekeeping notes, first of all. Okay, uh, so this is a moderated panel um, where we will have uh, questions and answers uh, that you may access through the button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, I'd kindly like to ask you to introduce yourselves when submitting a question, and these will be collected and raised after the presentations of the respective speakers. Uh, now, um, uh, diplomacy has a very long and storied history uh, uh, ever since human societies developed uh, and the need to interact between these groups um, formed and to, especially to avoid warfare. So while over time, the effort to deliver these messages has eased thanks to advances in technology, uh, the tasks and expectations of diplomats have grown tremendously. Digital diplomacy, uh, which we might describe as the conveyance of messages and other diplomatic tasks through online and usually public means is perhaps the most clearly new trend of diplomacy in the 21st century. While we've uh, usually conceived of digital diplomacy as a means of engaging with online publics, COVID-19, which has forced us all into lockdowns, inhibited travel and physical interaction, and even forced uh, traditional state-to-state -state interaction into the online format. So the pandemic has really accelerated and intensified this transformation of the practice of diplomacy at every level. Today, we, we have uh, two of the world's leading experts on diplomacy and digital diplomacy in particular to speak to us on this topic. Uh, professor Rebecca adler Nielsen, firstly, is uh, our uh, professor of political si science at the University of Copenhagen, where she is the principal investigator for the project Diploface. Uh, investigating the relationship between di diplomatic negotiations and the public. She directs a digital disinformation research group exploring how disinformation spreads in the context of international conflicts and how it impacts on public debate. She is a member of the steering committee of the Copenhagen Center for Data Science, uh, Social Data Science, and she is also co-PI uh, of an interdisciplinary research project, HOPE, How Democracies Cope with COVID-19. She is also the author of a prize-winning book, Opting Out of the U European Union, Diplomacy, Sovereignty, and European Integration, which explores the everyday diplomacy and stigmatization of the UK and Denmark due to, due to the opt-outs of the European Union. Uh, she's also a member of the European Council on Foreign Relations, the, Oversight, uh, the board of the uh, Danish Institute for International Studies, and the Danish Intelligence Oversight Board. Uh, uh, we also have with us today, uh, Professor Cornelio Biola, who is uh, Associate Professor in Diplomatic Studies at the University of Oxford, head of the Oxford Digital Diplomacy Research Group, and also serves as a faculty fellow at the Center on Public Diplomacy at the University of Southern California, and as professorial lecturer at the Diplomatic Academy of Vienna. He has published extensively on issues related to the impact of digital diplomacy on the conduct of diplomacy with recent focus on public diplomacy, international negotiations, and methods for countering digital propaganda. His recent co-edited volume, Digital Diplomacy and International Organizations, Autonomy, Legitimacy, and Contestation, refer, examines the broader ramifications of digital technologies on international dynamics, multilateral policies, and strategic engagements of international organizations. I should also add that his textbook, Understanding International Diplomacy, is a must read for students of foreign policy and diplomatic studies. So with that, uh, those introductions, I will now invite our first speaker, Professor Adler Nissen, to take the floor. Professor Adler Nissen, the screen is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Joel, and thank you for that very generous introduction of both me and my wonderful colleague, uh, Cornelio. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and I'm, I'm very much looking forward to also your comments and questions. So I'm just going to share my, my, uh, my screen with you um, with some slides. And um, what I'm going to present today 
is uh, what will probably be, hopefully, <laughs> a forthcoming article in the journal St Global Studies Quarterly that's co-authored with my colleague, Kristin Egelin. Um, and we call it the synthetic situation diplomacy, scoping media and the digital mediation of estrangement. And I'm just going to, in the next 15 minutes or so, go through sort of the main arguments and how this relates to the topic of today. So um, I think we're all fascinating by diplomacy, at least those in the Zoom room today, as, as you were mentioning in the introduction, this idea that diplomacy is a mediation of different parties, be they cities, countries, um, or even persons. And Dedarian's very famous presentation of diplomacy as the mediation of estrangement has this idea that somehow diplomacy creates a connecting link, an intervention between two or more individuals that allows for diplomacy's nature to unfold. And so the question um, that we ask here is, what does it do um, if we think of mediation in a somewhat different way? Because if mediation is not just that sort of a relational aspect, but it actually has a more social material sense, at least today, then we can see the pandemic as an invitation also to think about diplomacy, not just as bringing together people in face-to-face -face encounters, but also looking at the work done by technological media to create the conditions for such an encounter in the first place. So that is kind of the background for thinking about diplomacy as the digital mediation of estrangement. Um, and uh, we come to this from uh, the project Diplophase that we were, uh, that you just mentioned, funded by the European Research Council, where we have been looking at how diplomats use technological media, uh, social media, but also other kinds of electronic media. And what happened, of course, in Europe as the rest of the world was in the spring of 2020, everything clocked, closed down. So you had this immediate close down. And some scholars have already started investigating this as a kind of natural experiment <laughs> in which we can see what really happens when everything goes or almost everything goes digital. So the question we're asking is what happens to diplomatic life when it moves online and how can we conceptualize this move? And what you see in the photo is uh, the president of the European Council, uh, uh, Michel, who sits all by himself all alone in front of a screen with his colleagues from the other uh, member states, the 27 other member states. And they're also sitting all by themselves. And this is unprecedented. So we have of course had video calls, but this having these huge summits this way is uh, not only uh, absurd, but a real disruption. And um, what we did was we uh, were already doing um, immersive field work. So we were uh, following and shattering diplomats in Brussels in the multilateral scene there, uh, their staff, the interpreters, trying to get into meetings, trying to sort of figure out how they were using uh, Twitter and Facebook, et cetera, but also how they thought about these technologies. And what happens then to us <laughs> is that our field closes down. We can't go to Brussels anymore. We can't follow our diplomats. Um, and, uh, what we do then is we go digital as everyone else. So we keep in contact with our practitioners. So the same people that we've been following when they were actually meeting face-to-face, -face, we now follow when they go to the working group on Teams or Skype or Zoom or whatever. And so in a sense, our, our research uh, question, which was how does digital diplomacy really work, kind of becomes magnified or accelerated by the pandemic. And our main, idea was that social distancing and this online meeting must somehow challenge uh, diplomacy as a face-to-face -face interaction, as creating that trust and confidentiality, uh, relationship building, which everyone always has been emphasizing throughout space and time, that you need a face-to-face -face and physical encounter. Um, but what we find in our field work, both the remote and the immersive, is it's it's more complex than that. Um, so we are clearly seeing a life change 
But the pandemic, we believe, is revelatory of deeper transformation of diplomacy. I'm going to try to give some ideas of what it means. The first thing we need to notice, uh, as we might expect, is that the ambassadors, so the basically the engine room, they don't like this. And what they've been allowed to do, and here comes in the hierarchy of diplomacy as well, is whereas the junior diplomats have been relegated to the virtual video conferences, ambassadors have insisted on meeting always, every week, as they always did. And so they perform this heroic exceptionalism, a script that also Eva Neumann has talked about. Um, and here's an, a, an interview um, on the phone saying, you know, I don't be believe in the doomsday prophets. I've always, we've always been good at coordinating, he says, when the EU was looking as if it couldn't uh, find any solidarity. And he says, the biggest change is maybe that we don't now have to negotiate with the doors open, that there are fewer people in the room and that we can no longer shake hands or kiss. There was a brief moment when we discussed whether to stop meeting face to face, but that was just in the beginning. Now we just keep a meter and a half distance and we disinfect our hands. So it smells like a bar, but we continue our work. So as you see already here, there's a lot of resistance to the digital. There's this claim that you cannot, and there's another uh, ambassador who says, basically, if we stop meeting face to face, the EU will fall apart. It's, it's at that level. So they have this exceptional right to still meet in Brussels in the multilateral headquarters, but everyone else, even their own leaders, meet on video. Um, so how can we conceptualize this? In our paper, we suggest that synthetic situation, this concept developed by the Austrian sociologist Kevin Knossetina, is a good way of thinking about this. And what it does, it, it, it's a concept she develops from ethnographic studies of international financial trading, trading. So traders sitting almost sort of glued to the screen and watching the, the market on their screens across the world. And we find very interesting similarities with how our diplomats are dealing with the pandemic. And what she wants to do theoretically is to update Goffman's notion of social interaction to the 21st century. She says basically Goffman wasn't, and for good reasons, aware and taking account of the mediated and technologically mediated realities of social interactions today. So whereas Goffman talked about um, interactions as kind of naked, that is your meeting physically immediate, her argument is that increasingly this is not an accurate picture of how interactions work. And she said this, 10 years before the pandemic, our world is becoming more what she calls synthetic. And the synthetic situations in her definition is a social encounter that relies at least partly on sociological mediation to exist. It is made via what she calls scopic media, which is what we are now using here in Zoom, that are technological, often screen-based tools enabling users to observe and project uh, sounds and images and representations bringing what is physical distance into virtual proximity. In other words, um, we are co-present, but we're not present in the same physical room. And that is, she says, that does something um, in, in her really important work. And we're inspired by this to say, well, what we can see is that actually using this lesson, then of course diplomacy was also synthetic pre-COVID. So in that sense, many of the aspects we're now sort of surprised at or looking at were already there. But COVID of course does it something uh, much more dramatic and it's a much more forced process. So what we also see is that now, as well as previously global diplomacy happened via scopic media in screen worlds. And so we have perhaps been overemphasizing the face-to-face -face meeting in, in IR literature because that wasn't even the reality before the, the pandemic. Um, and if you think of, um, uh, for instance, interpretations during multilateral meetings, many of, of our diplomats sit with, the, with their, their, their phones on or listen to simultaneous interpretation. These are also ways in which negotiations have been mediated for a long time. Another example would be that they sit in the negotiation room and text their home capitals for information. So in that sense, the synthetic situation 
um, we insist is something that was always there. But what it enables us to do is to assess how both online and digital, offline and what Goffman would call naked domains, are participating in the very articulation of diplomatic practice. So it's not new. And you can see an example from before uh, uh, the pandemic here, we are um, allowed to sit in, a, in, a, in the back room of a, a meeting uh, in the in the Council of Ministers, and you can see the many technological devices already at use. So while they're meeting physically, they're definitely also assisted by and using the props of a technological mediated world. Um, so it is more extreme now. And what do our participants say? They claim of the same things that we claim of Zoom fatigue, uh, exhaustion, having to do childcare while negotiating, but also um, a way they explain to us that the digital devices are not just means or helpful means, but they are the, the very enablers now of diplomatic practice. So without the video conference, we would have no in interaction. Um, so on the one hand, we find that they're extremely frustrated and they seek to resist any kind of attempt to move them completely into the online world confirming in that sense, the hypothesis that physical co-presence is key. But on the other hand, and this is perhaps the most interesting finding is we can see them taking core elements of diplomacy and their practice, trust, tact, sociability online. So what they will do is they will put their flags in the background. They will dress up, even if they're wearing sandals underneath <laughs> outside the, the Zoom room, they will try to do small talks and they will try to imitate the face-to-face -face encounter with the same decorum and the same decor. And what they also explain to us is how embedded and embodied the screen becomes to them. So they're almost glued to their screens. They have this sense that they always have to be on. And in that sense, the private and the intimate and the personal and the political are all melding for them. And so we think we should not just think of diplomacy as either or analog or digital, but also as synthetic or, or mediated in this way. And this may also help us understand situations pre-COVID. So I'm going to end with a few questions for IR um, that we think this, these observations raise. The questions of inequality of access, who gets invited into the virtual diplomatic spectacle? Who is essential? So for instance, the press is clearly a losing partner here. They are, there are no doorsteps, there are no interviews, there are no informal chatter in the, in the rooms. That is lost. How is this gendered? How is this tied to nationality? And how is this tied to technological advances within countries? Is there possibilities to make diplomacy more transparent or democratic in this way? Or is it actually doing the opposite? Clearly, uh, we can see that it's resisted, but it's also embodied and embedded. And it does change the everyday of diplomacy, the way it's performed today. Of course, questions of how long it will stay with us are, cu are crucial, not just for us, but for our practitioners. But we think that the synthetic situation as such as a concept is helpful, not just for diplomacy, but also for understanding maybe global politics more, more broadly in terms of who gets to invite it into that virtual encounter. And I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Thanks, Professor Adler Nissen. Thank you for those um, very um, intriguing photographs, actually, of uh, the changes that have happened uh, in recent times. I, I, I'm struck by the way you described how technology can creates the conditions for engagement. So that synthetic um, uh, element has always been there, as you say, and it reminds me of the famous red telephone between Washington and Moscow that developed, obviously, over the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Cold War, and so on, and how that was actually was, um, seen as a, a, a revelation, a critical part of the diplomatic toolkit um, at the time. And again, now we have the Zoom screen, perhaps another new essential element of the diplomatic toolkit. Um, so moving on, uh, we should uh, invite Cornelius to um, uh, share his presentation. Cornelius. 
Thank you very much, Joel, for the um, uh, for the introduction, and also you know to organizers for um, uh, putting together this panel. Many thanks again, you know, to Rebecca for the brilliant presentations. Uh, Rebecca, always, uh, you know, uh, it's a pleasure to, to to follow your your articles and your presentation. Every time I learn new things, interesting new things. Uh, and I guess, you know, uh, we can say nowadays that we are all we all have gone synthetic uh, <laughs> during the pandemic uh, in different ways. Um, so uh, what I like to do in the next uh, uh, 10, uh, 15 uh, minutes or so, um, I like to uh, um, pick up uh, from what uh, Rebecca uh, told us uh, about how diplomats have tried to adapt to the pandemic. Um, and we, we know that uh, has been an uh, uneven process and uh, the, 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 it's still going on. And I think we still have to, to learn a lot, you know, from how diplomacy is being is adapting uh, to, to, the, to the digital world. Uh, but what I like to do is to, to take us uh, to take uh, us, you know, to the, to the beginning, uh, to the original moment, uh, which was um, depending on location. Um, it was uh, February or March 2020. I think in Singapore, for instance, you know, probably it was because it was closer to the point of origin. It was probably January, February. In 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 in, uh, in Europe, it reached uh, the pandemic reached uh, the beginning uh, of the pandemic. Uh, it was probably February or March. So for me, it was uh, uh, quite interesting, right? So this is something that hasn't happened before. If we go back to a global pandemic, we may think about the Spanish flu about 100 years ago, the Black Plague, you know, <laughs> hundreds of years ago. Uh, but nothing comparable. SARS in 2012, uh, 2002 has, or 2003 hasn't reached a global scope. So this is interesting because uh, how do you react to something that hasn't happened? Uh, this is not, uh, you know, how, how, especially for Ministry of Foreign Affairs, you are thrown in a situation um, with no clear reference points, and you you struggle to make sense of what is going on. You try to understand, you know, how to react. And I found this question fascinating, that the starting moment of the crisis and how to compare responses for various, uh, from various ministries of foreign affairs. So this is why I thought it might be interesting to look at, uh, to reverse a little bit the question, uh, not to focus necessarily on how the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, um, use digital diplomacy to react or to, uh, to the crisis, but actually to look a little bit deeper into how digital diplomacy, what digital diplomacy teach us uh, about crisis management during this period, right? To use digital diplomacy as an interpretative lens to understand something interesting about that. But as, as uh, Rebecca uh, struggled, you know, conceptually, you know, and uh, reached out for the synthetic theory, which I found it quite, quite interesting. I have to check it again. Um, I was also struggling how to make sense of the situation that is completely novel and how people try to, to, to do this. Um, this is not particularly easy. Uh, uh, being thrown in a situation and trying to make sense. I remember myself uh, at the end of February, and I thought all of us you know, have their own stories, but um, uh, end of February, uh, I remember the moment when I realized this is something serious. Um, uh, on my way to the airport uh, to Boston. Uh, I was, I just finished a talk uh, at, at Harvard at that time, and I was on my way to Rome for another talk. Uh, and and to, to, the, to the airport, I was checking the Twitter feed, and something caught my attention. I said, well, you know, there's something going on in Italy. I'm not going to go. And I sent them a message, you know, so sorry, I think the situation is a bit serious uh, now. I prefer to move to Skype to switch to Skype. And I also added Twitter, Twitter made me do it. So just to, uh, as, as an apology. Uh, but there was a moment in the spur of the moment when I realized, look, you know, something is not, is not doing, I mean, it's, it's getting serious. So I've been wondering, you know, how different ministries of foreign affairs have, have, uh, have realized, you know, uh, that, that, uh, that crisis and uh, how did they uh, the, the, uh, think about it? Now, conceptually speaking, as again, you know, um, I, I'm using a framework that I developed in a different, and my humble apologize, you know, for the naval gazing. It's an article that I published in 2015 after the Ukrainian crisis. And why do I go back to this? Because of this world, of this concept, world disclosure, which I found particularly interesting in this context. This is a concept that comes from Martin, uh, Martin Heidegger, uh, 
So don't worry, I'm not going to <laughs> scare you with, uh, with the philosophical uh, uh, ellipticism of, of Heidegger. But I think he has an interesting point there, which I developed a little bit in that article. Um, is that you know the, the way in which we make sense of what is happening is that um, in a sense uh, there are two layers of this process in which we understand the world. Um, so when you are thrown, this is a word that he's been. When you are thrown in a situation, um, the world is pre-reflectively uh, 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 shown to you. You don't have much control of what is going. You try to pick up cues to connect the dots. Uh, there is something there um, uh, because of the novelty of the situation in which you try to sense the, 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 the key word here is sensing, sensing what is happening. He uses a more, you know, Heidegger is always a big or fancy word, a factness, uh, which in German sounds even more horrible. But uh, uh, I think that, that the idea here is more about, you know, trying not necessarily to rationalize what is happening to, to put, you know, in a rational way, but to pick up cues, to understand. They say it happened. They pick up cues from the Twitter at the time that, you know, something doesn't feel right. So I found that, you know, this kind of uh, a presentation of the world in front of us, I didn't control what was going on. I know that something was happening. So from this point of view, I started to realize uh, the risk and, and the complexity of the situation. So for Heidegger in this case, you know, the idea is that there are two layers of in which uh, of this idea of world disclosure. One, the first layer is when the world is pre-reflectively disclosed to us. The second one is uh, when we actually contribute to the disclosure of the world, our reaction, our way in which you now seize uh, the moment, right, to do certain things. It doesn't mean that we act smartly, it's just that we react, we try to make sense of how things are happening. So we start to reflect Right? We start to apply different ideas, benchmarks from the past, you know, probably, or, you know, uh, uh, learning uh, on the spot how to, uh, this is a meaning creative process, what is uh, my philosophy. It's, it's in which you rework certain type of concepts to apply to a new situation. So this is why I found that the idea of what this process can make sense in novel situation for which you don't have necessarily, you know, clear benchmarks. Um, and now at this point, you may wonder what's with the boots? I mean, this is a famous painting of Van Gogh. Um, my, uh, and it became even more famous because, you know, uh, Heidegger commented and used that to illustrate this idea of full disclosure. In what sense? When we look at the boots, you know, it's, it's an interesting painting, but many may, may think, you know, look, this kind of boots, you know, this is something that I want to wear, you know, this is... Uh, but Heidegger, when you look at them, saw two different things. It saw a little bit, you know, the, the world, of the person, of the owner of the shoes, right? The type of context uh, in which that person lived, that type of element of um, the, 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 the pretty reflective, let's say, you know, uh, uh, disclosed world in which that person, he assumed that person was a, 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 a woman peasant. And also she, he, when you look at the painting, not only the context in which that person lived, but also how she reacted, you know, the hard work that she had to put, the fact that she couldn't change the, 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 the boots and so on and so forth. So why do I mention the boots? Because I think, I think now the tweets are the new boots. These are the, the tweets are the elements that help us, in a sense, understand the context in which digital diplomats operate, but also how they try to transcend the situation in which they find themselves. So I use them in a sense, in a, same, in a similar way like Heidegger, as a way of trying to make sense of how the world is being disclosed in a pre-reflective way, but also how twists then change a little bit through reaction, through enactment, the world that is disclosed. So these are the two layers that I've been trying to do as a conceptual framework. Good, so what does it mean? in terms of, you know, uh, research. So I, I tried then, you know, to go back to certain questions uh, about the uh, original moment. Uh, how did they make sense of the crisis and MFAs? Uh, how did they cope with the idea of uncertainty? You know, uh, whether I can get this kind of sense, you know, from the tweets about, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 the way in which they try to to reduce or, to, show, or to, to, to compress, you know, the level of sensitivity. And also one, what kind of issues uh, uh, they have highlighted. You can highlight different things uh, during a, a, a crisis. It's not necessarily that you uh, a crisis because of the novelty, because of the way in which it affects you, it doesn't affect you. Uh, 
So um, my idea, I mean, uh, was to look at different Ministry of Foreign Affairs. For the purpose of the presentation, I'm going to mention the German MFA. Why German? It's an interesting case. Um, I've been thinking about UK, but UK from a, a variety of reasons uh, uh, didn't fit well into my research project that time. Something happened that Boris Johnson got sick and all the tweets during that uh, period, you know, got, you know, uh, so I don't get a lot. Uh, so my analogies will focus then on Boris Johnson, which I didn't necessarily wanted to do. Um, so German MFA is also um, uh, um, uh, well respected in Europe. People are looking up. Uh, there was a, a, a something important about that. So I tried to I collected all the tweets they they, they posted. You know, during that. there are not so many, 115. And then uh, uh, we classify the tweets, both the text, what it says, but also the image is important nowadays. Sometimes in tweets, the image is more important because you get a sense, is a person alarmed? Is a person calm? Is a person, you know, reaching out to others? Are they using what uh, Rebecca says, you know, this kind of uh, technological tools? How do they react to that? And then I classify by, by, by various uh, criteria, you know, the general things. What are they talking about? Then I zoomed in on a particular subset, the COVID teams. And then I added laminations. So when you talk about the COVID, they may want to emphasize or to develop the point about COVID. They may say, you know, certain things about location, or they add certain hashtags, or they highlight certain actions that they want to do. They're, 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 what I call laminations that layers of meaning that is being attached to the original root uh, message. And then I use a, a particular scale to, to, to classify this subset of tweets to capture this distinction that I mentioned before between sensing of the pre-reflective world and the way in which you react to that distinction. So let's see what I've got. So when I looked at that, you know, uh, this is uh, the, the time out. I mean, there's a variety of messages that they have been uh, uh, posted during that uh, period. I think what is interesting, uh, the, the, the color, you know, uh, may, may give it away. The blue ones are the one related to COVID. You know, you can see the hashtag COVID. So this is an interesting uh, distinction there, right? On March 13th, something happened. Uh, so March 13th, you can see that, you know, uh, after March 13th, you know, COVID messages, you know, started to be uh, pumped out. Interestingly, there is only one on the second, the blue dot here, right? Uh, which is about, it's interesting, it's uh, between March and uh, uh, the second and March 13th, is a gap. There is a gap. It's an interesting gap. So what happened on second, on March 2nd, there was a message about Iran that the situation in Iran is alarming and Germany together with others started to, uh, to uh, create a package, a package for Iran. Uh, so this is important because you start realizing that they actually know that the problem was serious, right? Still, you know, they didn't think that it was serious enough. There was another message uh, on the same day in which uh, Heiko Maas you know, spoke about, you know, the coronavirus and highlighted, hey, in order to overcome this situation, we need to work together. So there was a moment some cues that they started to come together. Nevertheless, you know, for the next uh, uh, 10, uh, 10 days, nothing. Uh, there was a lot of talk about uh, a relation between Turkey and Germany and the many other things, nothing on COVID. On March 13th, this is a message, which is a very unassuming message, if you think about it, I'm sorry. It's a, 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 a meeting. This is first time when you have the, the video conference, by the way, I mean, <laughs> of things to come. Uh, 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 this is a moment when uh, trying to talk together with the other peoples in the region, you know, uh, the, the Visegrad group about the situation. But look at the tone. Uh, this is not something alarming. Uh, yeah, okay, uh, we need to think about, you know, how to do certain things. But not something of the scale that you may expect. Nevertheless, in the coming uh, days, you know, you have more and more messages, you know, related to that. To the point that on the 24, this is where you got most of the retweets. Uh, on the 24, it was this message related to uh, Italy, when they started actually to bring patients from Italy uh, to uh, to to um, to, uh, um, uh, to Germany, so I, I think this this is particularly interesting in the way in which they reacted, um, uh, and try to 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 deal with certain situation at that point. Um, but also the question of Italy. So you have on one hand Iran, no reaction at that time, situation quite serious in Iran. On the other hand. Italy started, you know, to create a great impression on Germany. It trained, it started to frame the understanding of the crisis, a point that I'll get back later. 
So that's one uh, first cut into how, how uh, they created. The second one that I did was to, okay, what happened to my, okay. So the second point, what I did is to concentrate on the COVID uh, subset and try to see exactly these things and laminations that were particularly attended, you know, placed. And what you see, you have different conversations about international collaboration, G7 at that time happening, travel restriction, many other things. There are two topics that stand out, one about repatriation from various places and the one on solidarity, uh, especially with Italy, France and a few others. You can see from the number of retweets that, you know, the second two uh, repatriations started to get the attention of the online public as well. Uh, the other two were more muted in terms of what was being discussed. I think this is uh, the point in which you said, well, you know, okay, so when you talk about COVID, what kind of direction, how do you make sense? What seems to be the element that seems to that allows you to make sense of what is going on and also to react to a certain extent. So to, uh, repatriation was, and I think, you know, it's not particularly surprising, right? This is, uh, you know, a reaction probably, you know, uh, immediate reaction that makes sense. It worked pretty well. It's not only Germany doing that, others, uh, but also because it emphasizes the role of, of uh, uh, crisis response systems that have been in place for many, many ministries of foreign affairs, including in Europe after the terrorist attacks that uh, a few years ago, but also in other places because of natural disasters. Most of the ministries they have digital crisis responses, and this one um, uh, it was activated pretty quickly, and you can see a lot of responses to that. The solidarity aspect, I think, is particularly interesting because it's about it. It's about how Italy played a crucial role for framing uh, the crisis uh, for Germany and also to a certain extent their responses. So when I looked at, uh, I zoomed, I zoomed in uh, again on, uh, on Italy, you see again, you know, that, that uh, there is this particular aspect. Um, it's not only about expressing solidarity, but doing certain concrete things. This is the most novel thing because you real, uh, realize, you know, that the shortage of PE equipment, but also getting involved in questions about treatment, uh, that uh, that was a particular uh, strong element that I think it highlighted quite well uh, for many, the seriousness, the severity, the severity of the crisis. The final uh, uh, visual that I have is about this. What is this? It goes back to this Heidegger aspect about sensing versus reacting. So what I've done here is basically to classify the tweets. So what you see on one hand, you see uh, the number of retweets, right? What kind of messages, you know, have been retweeted. But on the other hand, when you look at the line, the thinner the line, the more uh, sensing, the, 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 the thicker the line, the more reacting, the more participation type of thing. I've done that on a scale from one to five. One is sensing, five is active participation reaction. So what does it mean? So when I consult with people, I don't necessarily react much. I try to make sense of the situation. If I don't have something in terms of actions that I want to pursue, I put that as a, more on one or two in terms of sensing. When I uh, mobilize resources to bring people to Germany for treatment, that's more you know, in terms of reaction, participation, try to make sense. It's not only absorbing information, it's more about reacting, using that to reward a little bit, you know, how I, I do this. And it's interesting to see again, uh, that particular aspect. So from the 22 to, 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 to the, the last day, it was not, uh, uh, there was a gap, something. And then, you know, a little bit repatriation here. And then you have, you know, the, the solidarity with Italy in that particular, more active, more engagement. It's an interesting graph because it tells you that actually why it took a long time for, for the German MFA to adapt to the situation. At some point, they, you know, they, they went in full gear uh, in terms of uh, uh, absorbing or creating. But it also tells you about the importance of Italy in the picture. So what does, um, so just in the interest of time, you know, um, what does uh, digital diplomacy teach us about how COVID tried to disclose itself to the German MFA? One, there's several concepts that I like to introduce. One is the idea of sensors. I love sensors now. I mean, my, my entire house is now <laughs> full of sensors because of Internet of Things. I love them. Uh, but the idea here of sensor is more about the fact that you have one of Iran, you have one of Italy that sort of tried to present the crisis to you. You nevertheless, it was, you may say, well, because Italy it was closer, that might uh, make a difference. 
but I think it shows how much um, importance these transacts have for you to trigger a particular reaction, to frame the crisis in a particular way, especially when the crisis was novel. So it was Iran at the beginning, 10 days, nothing happened. And then all of a sudden you see something, uh, even then, you know, the, the, the Italy uh, entered in full lockdown on the 9th of March, four more days until Germany reacted, which takes me to the second point, the autopilot function for Ministry of Foreign Affairs in managing. I mean, that, that's something that uh, uh, existed, you know, in which they apply standard procedures. They look for uh, other uh, ways in which they try to think. There is a delay, there's a significant delay. Uh, and this is the autopilot thing, I think is particularly important because it links to this uh, adaptation process um, that comes from the way in which, you know, the crisis is being sensed. I think another important point in tax speaks is that in crisis, you learn about reflexes. These are things that, you know, when, when, when you get burnt, you know, you, 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 you take your hand off, right? So these are reflexes that you learn about how countries react to the crisis. Uh, uh, and I think what it revealed when you look at the type of hashtags, they emphasize, I haven't seen many other countries doing that. Stronger overnight, it, uh, European Union, you expect that to do, but member states, a different game. I'm not sure for instance, the, uh, if Denmark has, use them. Uh, so stronger united, uh, uh, Europe united, stronger together. There was a lot of emphasis of that. And that uh, uh, speaks a little bit about, you know, this, this Europeanist and uh, slight internationalist uh, uh, diplomatic reflex that you have in the case. And I think it's uh, particularly important when you compare that with other countries, probably. And final point is also about the role of public expectations, the way in which we shape them uh, um, 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 uh, during the crisis. It's not only the domestic, these are Ministry of Foreign Affairs, these are not governments, you know, ministries of health or anything. It's about the domestic international audience, the way in which you uh, want to present themselves to the outside world during the crisis. I think this dimension is not particularly understood by some Ministry of Foreign They just focus on domestic, but I think the image that they try to put out there, I think is particularly important. So what does it mean, you know, for, for crisis management? I think, you know, from our perspective, I think it's quite important to look at uh, these autopilot functions compare. And there's uh, two other cases that I had um, started to look at, Russia and Turkey. Why is that? Because when I look in March, both of them don't speak much about COVID. Russia has a couple of uh, tweets, Turkey, none, zero during, uh, during, uh, during uh, March. So I think it's important to understand why these uh, countries, you know, work on Itopala so much. Uh, there might be different reasons, but it tells us also something about the ability to manage crisis. Um, so the autopilot aspect, I think, during the crisis, you may choose, there is a delay and try to absorb information, try to make sense and use this kind of, you know, predefined procedure, I think is particularly interesting to look at. And, and uh, um, the second one is diplomatic reflection. This is fascinating, I think, in terms of understanding and comparing. The initial moment when they, they were hit, how did countries, how, what do you learn about the deeper diplomatic reflection though? Do they provide a useful digital map to understand points of friction and probably uh, opportunities for solving the crisis? We learned about Germany, uh, we learned quite a lot about Germany about how they initially reacted to this. Uh, um, I don't think you'll see the same reflex in the case of UK. <laughs> uh, there might be different uh, reflexes in the case of Denmark, but I think there is a useful map, analytical insight that you can put together to understand certain things, important things about it. This is when they are, to use, you know, Rebecca's term, you know, uh, uh, naked in face of the crisis, right? They, 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 they don't, they, they react under the, the imperative of the moment. And final point, which I think it's probably the, the most interesting for me, but fascinating, it's, it's, it's are we entering the stage of real time knowing in crisis management? This is uh, with the rise, uh, this is something that I've been working for a different organization at the moment, in which you, all the, all the things that I mentioned before, you can actually do it in real time, in which you absorb information from Twitter, you do the data modeling, you get the results in a second. But if you do that, what does it mean in terms of, you know, uh, interaction with the others? Uh, there is an interesting new literature talking about the rationality of speed, how digital accelerates, accelerates. And you are in a crisis which is <laughs> accelerating by itself, nevertheless. 
and then you have this, this kind of digital that adds a new dimension because you want to add analytical insight of the kind that I mentioned, but at the same time, you know, that, that uh, also introduces a new dynamic in the, uh, the second layer of, of, of world disclosure, the, the layer that you actually reshape the world. So let me uh, um, uh, conclude this, this comments with, uh, with um, two observations you know, from, from a survey. So this was about the beginning. The crisis has changed. We are now at a different uh, uh, thing. And the, what I found interesting is that one year later, when we asked people about you know, how they feel about the crisis, and that connects back you know, to Rebecca's point, uh, there were different impressions. So at the beginning, you know, people were not particularly, you were, as you mentioned, you know, some, somehow uh, uh, anxious about what is going on. Uh, now uh, you have different. On one hand, uh, uh, people say, well, you know what, all these kind of, you know, new things, you know, allow us actually to focus on the substance of, of, of diplomacy, less fanfare, less aspect, less protocol. I don't know whether that's the case, you know, if you still ask diplomats, answer is not something that they may be happy with it. Uh, for others, they say, well, you know, uh, we miss the non-verbal aspects of communication. We miss, you know, the, 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 the certain things that happen. So there is some more, you know, to, 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 to the eye than, but I think what is important here in terms of the context is that the, the, the participation, we moved on, right? So the all that was predisclosed to us in March is no longer there. Uh, we already changed in different ways through this kind of engagement. So if a crisis happened now, of course, the reaction would be different. This is why I, I wanted to include this, these comments at the end. So I'm going to stop here and, and uh, I'll open up you know, the, the floor for discussion. Thank you all. Thank you, Cornelie. That is a very, very interesting presentation. Again, um, uh, it's... Uh, it, uh, um, First of all, let me remind the audience that uh, you can ask questions through the Q&A button down below at your screen, and we are uh, now going to proceed to the discussion. Um, I, just a, a quick, uh, my in, in, initial reaction to Cornelius' pre presentation, I'm struck by how much difference there is quite literally in a matter of days, um, and March 13th, was it? Uh, that that really seemed to, to change everything. <laughs> uh, I I do recall um, at that time they were still trying to hold football matches. As a fan of English football, I <laughs> was keen to keep them going. But then suddenly, all, uh, they went from we are proceeding as normal, and then everything changes overnight, and all, everything gets cancelled. So so much disruption happened in a span of a few days, and I can see how that works out in on the diplomatic field as well. Um, and the tweets um, that you've shown us clearly demonstrate that um, transition. Uh, thanks also for talking about this idea of sensing and reacting, making sense of our world. That I, I, it resonates with us over here. We we perhaps were exposed to the crisis a bit earlier, but you know the, um, uh, we had so much less information in January, especially. Uh, what is this disease? What what do you call it? Uh, what how does it spread and so on uh, and uh, these things um, ma made public messaging extremely important during that time and uh, need to engage the public just as urgent um, so uh, um, we've had two very very good presentations um, I, I think among for the students and researchers amongst us um, that was also a very good um, object lesson in how to conduct virtual field work <laughs> uh, with the, all these um, things going moving online um, you've managed to uh, come up with uh, cutting edge really research that has uh, lo loads of potential to be applied in so many different ways so I thank you both of you for that very good presentation um, so I'm while we're waiting for some questions to come in I thought I would kick start um, the Q&A myself uh, uh, I, I, it's um, interesting to me that um, uh, Rebecca's point earlier about how the the diplomats in Brussels insisted on keeping things physical, even as almost everyone else went virtual, including their leaders. Um, it uh, is right now um, or right about to happen. So we hope uh, is a ASEAN special summit in Jakarta on Saturday, where they will engage physically, uh, getting all the senior leaders, ASEAN leaders, heads of state, uh, to meet with the Myanmar leader, uh, coup leader who is um, 
uh, not <laughs> minded to want to negotiate, but um, because of the crisis there, ASEAN feels like it has to do something. And while ASEAN, um, quite in contrast with Europe, really went fully virtual and, and even the meetings, the, the, the number of meetings died down or were postponed and so on. Um, I, I did note, notice that Europe, Europe continued to meet. I mean, you were still in the, uh, uh, discussions on very pressing mat matters such as Brexit and so on, which required a, a lot more physical engagement. Whereas in ASEAN, we're perhaps almost a little bit uh, uh, completely tunneled under um, as most of the countries had early lockdowns. Uh, you know, we had our first cases in January and February uh, and uh, a lot of uh, things just shut down much earlier than Europe did. So it's consequently the foreign um, ministries, the meetings and so on um, cut down. So uh, it's interesting now, of course, that with such a ma major crisis on our hands, we've got uh, the, the leaders have decided that they need to meet physically. This will not work in a virtual fa format. Uh, and um, it's also raised some interesting political questions. For example, the, the, the Thai prime minister has stated he will not show up at this physical meeting and will send his foreign minister uh, in uh, his place. Of course, he says, of course, he's dealing with a crisis at home. It's a bit difficult to travel, and uh, which is a fair point, uh, but it also allows him to uh, other strategies um, of engagement. He might not be so closely associated with whatever the meeting, whatever happens at the meeting as well. Um, so my question, uh, firstly, to um, Rebecca uh, is, you, you've noticed all the di difficulties and um, challenges um, with dip diplomacy, but of, of course, also noting that some of these aspects are not that new, and just um, perhaps the format is new. Uh, and so um, I, I, what I'm curious about is what is, is there, a, or have you noticed any difference in terms of diplomatic outcomes? Like has the format and the, the, the distance changed things? Um, would you, can you identify perhaps some decisions or uh, mm -hmm. processes that might have turned out or you suspect would have turned out differently if they had had the opportunity to physically engage? Uh, or, um, the, perhaps, uh, you know, um, we've had uh, Brexit, which was extremely messy, uh, all the COVID uh, vaccine negotiations, et cetera. Um, what, what do you think might have changed? Uh, yes, that's, that's, I guess, the $100 million question that, that both Cornelio and I are asking ourselves in, in different ways. And by the way, can I just say, Cornelio, that was a brilliant presentation, super fascinating. Uh, so uh, I, I look forward to seeing also what comes, comes next. Um, but uh, but uh, on that question, what, what would have happened? It's kind of a counterfactual, right? Because we don't know what would have happened. But I have uh, a, a number of examples where diplomats themselves explain to me that they think the outcome would have been different. So for instance, a questions of solidarity in the beginning, and I think Cornelius' presentation relates here to, to this question, where he says, well, who do they actually show solidarity with, with which countries? And uh, my own country, Denmark, was not very quick at um, sending uh, equipment to Italy and other countries. And I ha have heard diplomats saying, what if the leaders, our own leaders had met, like prime ministers and met physically with their Italian counterparts, they would have immediately sensed the desperation in a much more emotional and much more direct way than just reading about it in a newspaper. So. In that sense, the physical encounter, the lack of physical encounter might have, have delayed the, the concrete expressions of solidarity in more sort of material sense where they were looking for ventilators and other kinds of medical equipment. That's one example. Um, and another one is of course uh, a Brexit where they realized and they explicitly said so, uh, we have to pause the, uh, the Brexit negotiations uh, until we can actually, we can't expect any progress until we can actually meet physically. So they had to reschedule the entire negotiation process and then eventually finding ways to meet physically, but accelerating the process in the end quite a lot. And um, of course, would it have had been me less messy? We will never know, but it didn't ease, ease the things that they couldn't meet physically as much as they would have 
and could have. So, so I, I think there are uh, many examples um, of, of, of how this disrupts. Of course, there are also ways in which it might help. So I mainly talked about the negative or the kind of the exhaustion, but there's also clearly many diplomats and leaders say, well, we can maybe fix some things quicker because some of the more less technical, less budget heavy stuff, uh, so maybe not Myanmar, but other things uh, that are less yeah, tricky can be fixed quicker if, with a quick video meeting, especially if you have the face-to-face -face alongside. So, so they can complement each other in the, in the best of two worlds. I also got some questions on the Q&A, but maybe that can wait. Yeah, yeah, the sure. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, so um, Auntie Cornelie, um, if I may ask, um, I, uh, referring to that chart of yours, um, which was very striking, um, I noticed, I mean, well, what was obvious, of course, was the uh, emergence of the COVID um, as a theme. Um, and it, uh, as an Asian, we, I'm thinking, how did they take two months to notice this was a problem? This would be a problem. <laughs> but that aside, I was wondering actually about the other things that, so, so what, it wasn't only that COVID messaging grew it, it strikingly in volume, but also the other things disappear. For all, more or less. Um, I was so I was wondering what are the costs of this, and and if you're talking about you know this I, idea of sensing making sense of the world um, and th through this public messaging, what were the things that were left behind, if you will, um, uh, from your study of these tweets? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think there are two uh, two things that I haven't mentioned about the tweets in March. One is about the autopilot function, as I said, in the case of Germany. And I think in Germany, the autopilot, especially this kind of uh, global crisis, international crisis, is particularly strong. Why is that? Because uh, generally speaking, they don't want to take the lead. They want to lead from behind. And I think that was an opportunity lost by the European Commission to step in early in March. I'm not trying to blame European Commission. I'm a strongly pro-Europeanist. I'm just saying that um, uh, at that time, I think, you know, uh, 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 pro, I think my, my impression was that the Germany was trying to connect with the other, to see, you know, how the others are moving and to try to, to steer a course of action. This is why it called repeatedly stronger united, you know, European united. And I think the European Commission was quite late in, in reacting to, to that uh, and uh, to get involved. It got involved later and I think it has done well. Uh, but I think there was an opportunity. The second uh, thing that was missing that we've seen later emerging, and I think would be interesting to compare the issue of disinformation, the infodemic, which hit hard. So the point I'm making about sensing is it's a bit sanitized, right? Because you talk about sensing in, a, in an environment in which at the moment in March, all the nonsense, the 5G conspiracy, the Bill Gates nonsense, or all the nonsense, right? hasn't yet reached uh, uh, the, the, the Twitter sphere. Uh, it, it emerged, I had a, an article published last year, it emerged in, in, in April. At that time, for instance, the European Commission started to react to that as well. And I think what it tells you is that your, your sense it can be deformed, deformed again digitally, because the reality uh, uh, is being deformed, right, with this kind. And you have to react to that as well. Uh, of course, you have institutions that uh, are, are particularly suit, uh, suited for, for dealing with that. Um, uh, uh, but I think also Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, are important because all the stuff, remember, Germany, it was one of the first that started to provide this kind of solidarity to Italy and others and so on. That image sort of dissipated in the mass. I mean, uh, the, the credit that Germany deserved for that, it, uh, it was not, didn't stay long. Um, so other things uh, have come up, but it speaks about this, these two elements, shaping uh, expectation of the foreign public about the crisis. How do you like to, but at the same time, you have to do it um, uh, actively uh, because now this information is a part of life. Uh, it happened with the pandemic and it's going here to stay. This is something that we learned. Uh, it's, it didn't happen only in 2016 with the Brexit and the, because uh, this information is here to stay. This is part of our uh, uh, life. And I think that's something to, to remember when we think about sensing, how to do sensing in a, in a very messy, cloudy, uh, uh, distorted environment. 
And also a reaction, right? Uh, you want to react and at the same time, someone um, uh, pulls the rug under you and say, well, you know, you do this because you what, whatever, you know. Um, so uh, your reaction in a sense, you know, is being uh, uh, transmitted. I think it would be interesting to see, you know, I'd be wondering uh, at some point, you know, um, how uh, when we go to the point of vaccines, how the whole discussion about vaccine diplomacy, um, and that would be another uh, collection of tweets that we want to, uh, to, to understand, you know, how this uh, vaccine diplomacy uh, or various actors, not only, you know, started to play out in, in Europe in terms of, of, of sensing uh, and also reacting to different uh, uh, pushes by, by, by various governments. Thank you. Um, yeah, you're, you're, um, we have not actually touched much on disinformation, which of course is actually very, very prominent um, in this particular pandemic. Uh, and perhaps another, uh, we need to have another webinar on that. <laughs> uh, so anyway, um, let, let's move on to the questions um, from the floor, uh, from the audience, sorry. Um, Professor Alan Chong, who is the head of Center for Multilateralism Studies here, uh, she, he asks um, uh, Rebecca, uh, ha have you considered cases or practices outside Europe during the COVID year where selective meetings have taken place? Uh, China, for example, has gone out of its way to entertain high level foreign diplomats in Beijing and send its own foreign minister around Southeast Asia. Even uh, various uh, Southeast Asian states have resumed shuttle diplomacy. Uh, does this suggest that there is still a constituency within some diplomatic services who believe the old school interpersonal diplomacy is, re is still asserting itself or reasserting itself. Uh, secondly, when you propose something called synthetic diplomacy or politi synthetic politics and diplomacy, how different is this from the 90s or early 2000s research, for example, on things like the CNN effect and or perhaps Trump's Twitter diplomacy? Uh, and um, second question, I'll round up the questions for Rebecca here. Uh, Deepak Nair, who's a, a, a assistant professor at National University of Singapore, uh, he asks, uh, you concluded with a question uh, on whether diplomacy is becoming more democratic. Based on your field work among EU diplomats, is it becoming more democratic um, as conceived as uh, open, transparent to public audience? Uh, my hunch would be have been that diplomats will intensify efforts to find ways to recreate channels for private and maybe even secret correspondences, uh, WhatsApp groups and so on. Um, I, I actually I can interject here and say, I know for a fact that we, uh, we have with many diplomats with WhatsApp chat groups <laughs> in Southeast mm -hmm. Asia and, and um, other like-minded uh, delegations, secure one-to-one -one phone calls and so on. Uh, he's asking about the inherent uh, this contrast between the openness and the inherent conservatism of diplomacy. Yeah, uh, so great, great and, and important questions uh, on on the on cases outside of Europe. Um, we haven't done field work, but it's there. There's a really growing sense that it the pandemic has affected consular, bilateral, and multilateral settings very differently. And we can also already now see quite a, quite diverging coping strategies. Um, so it doesn't really, um, in that sense, it's also interpreted locally in different ways. Uh, but there's a global sense that the face-to-face -face encounter is kind of like the holy grail still of diplomacy. So there seems to be a sense that very few diplomats that we interview or observe would say that you can do away with that. The question is more how much of the synthetic or, di or digital that you would want to live with or, or use. Um, but, but I think it's, it's quite revelatory that there is a sense in which you can't let go of that. But, but the differences are quite, are quite, I mean, the bilateral relations are quite different uh, from the multilateral scenery, also simply because of the apparatus of people who need to, to come together. Um, for the second question on, on the, on, the, on the relationship between the synthetic situation as a concept and earlier uh, research on like the CNN effect, um, I think that there are dramatic differences because the synthetic situation is a very particular concept that is set to um, explain or, or, or help us understand an encounter between people which is mediated by technology, by scopic media. So it's, it's something that 
that clearly does something to the Goffmanian interaction, the, the, the face to face interaction. And the synthetic situations created by a scoping media, be they video conferences or even just the, the presence of a TV in a, in a doctor's waiting room, um, that does at least two common effects we often talk about is immersion. So you're immersed into a different place, even though you are, your body is in one space, but your mind is almost, part of your body is almost in another virtual space with other people that are in different parts of the globe. That's one thing, which is very different from the CNN effect. And the other effects of a scopic or synthetic uh, interaction is that you are exhausted in a different way. So while, while the CNN effect tried to say, uh, you see images and then you react in a different way and it hasn't been able, nobody has been able to prove that it was really correct because uh, the effects are more are different. Similarly with, with a Trumpian Twitter to, Twitter um, diplomacy, where the tweets are supposed to do every all the work, also seems to be uh, unfounded at least. Uh, and needs it needs more. The synthetic situation exists that it is indeed synthetic. It's a synthesis of the embodied, present physical uh, performance of diplomacy and the mediation uh, in a technology. So, so, so I believe they're they're very different. I hope that makes sense. Okay. Um, what have you thought about Deepak Nair's question about- Oh yes, Deepak's question. So this is a really interesting paradox. I thought when I set out to do, um, and I think many of us had that idea that it would open up diplomacy and that was what diplomats were complaining about, that now you can sit and leak from inside the negotiation room and the public can sort of follow every, every single step. Um, but what happened at least with the pandemic and the multilateral scene that I've been looking at is the opposite. Because as Deepak is alluding to, um, the who gets into invited into the synthetic situation, the, the Zoom room, as in this case, you can't just go by the room and just jump in or uh, join us. I, I, it's very difficult actually to get that invitation. So press, translators, insistence do not just sit in, in the, in the background and the back row. They do just meet um, uh, the, the diplomat in the, in the hallway or in the cafe uh, outside of the Europa building, right? So all those informal meetings that are crucial for the public to get a sense, and especially for journalists, are gone as you have this empty street of, of, uh, of the Place de Chaumont and the other places in, in Brussels. So it's, it, it has had a dramatic effect. And the attempts to invite the press in and so thus to make it more transparent, have, have, have not yet really worked because then they create a, a Zoom room afterwards, but the interaction and the interruptions and the sort of more blunt uh, discussions are gone. Uh, so, so, so far uh, on the democratic side, uh, uh, it's been uh, disappointed for those who wanted the digital diplomacy to be more democratic, at least in Europe, but maybe you've had different um, experiences um, in, in your parts of the world? Well, I can't say I've um, studied that um, aspect of the change, but I did I did notice the, the, the disappearance or absence of doorstops, like you had mentioned, um, immediately. So it's when, mainly when the Myanmar coup uh, happened and we knew that us and ministers were talking about things and I would look out for my usual people with good contacts and good ways to you know uh, good um, observe proceedings and none of them were talking so the, we knew that there was some some absence of um, direct interaction uh, that was no longer possible perhaps uh, because of the lack of that physical um, uh, mm -hmm. relationship okay so uh, professor Cornelia Rubiola uh, a question from Alan Chong our head um, he asks could some of your reflections on COVID impacted practices in the German MFA be explained via Graham Allison's type two model of decision-making, i.e. the uh, um, famous in foreign policy analysis, the organizational process model. In a way, uh, in short, did the German MFA have some ready rehearsed standard operating procedures, scripts or such for dealing with the pandemic or not? And could um, your argument be explained via postmodern theory, especially Darian and Virilio? Uh, 
And the latter two suggest that an estrangement occurs when electronic mediation is applied to diplomacy, the imagined, the fictitious exaggerations of terror become treated as real. And then there is the element of panic or knee-jerk reactions to an inestimable national security threat coming in through the channels of everyday globalization, i.e. Uh, travel. Um, the um, term autopilot that you've mentioned evokes all of these dilemmas, Alan Chong thinks. Uh, what, was your, what would your response be? Uh, uh, thank you, thank you very much, Alan, for your questions. Um, I think let, let's take them one by one. One on, on uh, Graham Allison. Um, uh, is it uh, is it this kind of competition between the various um, subunits uh, in the uh, British in the uh, German government uh, um, responsible for the delay and for the prolongation of the autopilot function? I think it might be the case, but my sense, I had different encounters with them in the past uh, four or five years. And it was interesting to see an evolution. So while at the beginning, you know, this kind of around 2015, 2016, you know, the whole thing about digital was, you know, at the beginning, you know, they didn't really believe in it. Then they started to accelerate. Um, they, they, they invested, you know, in, in resources uh, to do this kind of data analytics, you know, to understand trends in, in, in various places. They developed a unit of strategic communication, uh, which they, they refused to do it, but now they, they, they have, uh, you know. Uh, so I think there's been an institutional uh, evolution in the German MFA in which digital has become a more uh, a priority uh, for many. I uh, follow also the, 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 their account in, in other contexts. Uh, so I think now um, uh, those initial uh, reactions that uh, the questions implies about you know, competition have been not completely, but smoothened out a little bit. We also uh, have to understand that, that, that in Europe there have been a number of crises um, uh, in the past, uh, you know, the terrorist attacks, the refugee crisis, and all the other things. Uh, and they developed crisis responses, not only Germany, but others. So while they didn't have standard operating procedures necessarily for the pandemic, they have, uh, you know, how to deal with their own nationals when they are stranded or they are affected by events in other countries. So uh, it was Germany, we've seen that in the case of, of uh, in another different presentation, I looked at that in more uh, depth, um, US, UK, UK actually, you know, half, half of the messages was about that. Uh, so they activated these kinds of crisis responses, which were based on uh, practices and experiences that they had before with other crises. They just uh, uh, adjusted, and it worked, it worked pretty well. Um, uh, I was surprised to see Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, Ministry of Foreign, uh, the Minister, right, responding directly to certain queries uh, from people uh, stranded in Peru, for instance, right? Um, so uh, the digital uh, um, um, is not probably, uh, digital, Germany is need, not yet a digital powerhouse in Europe, but it is moving in that direction. Uh, uh, so I think this kind of, of responses, I think that are, are particularly um, uh, shaped by um, the question of speed is interesting, of Paul Virilio. I've uh, been a lot of research, and this is something that I, I found it fascinating because the digital acceleration changes things. It changes things about how to think. I mean, pandemic serves an accelerator in, in itself. Um, and uh, some of the research that I've seen, uh, the, the, the publications that I've seen are quite, uh, are quite uh, uh, interesting because um, they introduce this idea that uh, speed creates what it says, uh, um, temporal pathologies. In what sense they create te temporal pathologies? Because the key term here is that certain areas in which digital acceleration um, uh, 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 moves in, um, uh, creates a, um, a diff uh, what is called, you know, certain areas, domains are more speedable, others are less speedable, and that creates dis desynchronization between different uh, uh, aspects. Uh, um, uh, who is able to move fast, who is agile, who is not, who is left behind, and what kind of tensions to are, are likely to arise from this kind of desynchronization, temporal desynchronization. Speed, I think it's a very overlooked aspect of the digital transformation in digital diplomacy, and I think unduly so. Um, one element of, of, of that we see in the case of, I mentioned, you know, with disinformation, uh, where this information moves very fast, and you only playing the catch up. Uh, and they say, well, you know, it's not important. We still focus on the real thing and, you know, and stuff. But uh, what happens to this information affects what you do. 
and the spraying of ketchup. I mean, they haven't found any, you know, a right solution to dealing with this information at the moment, unless, you know, they beg, you know, Facebook to shut it down or whatever this account. Uh, but it's an example of desynchronization, temporal pathology in which the information moves fast, 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 fast. And you actually, you know, like a turtle after them, you know, with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, so trying to catch up and try to struggle, you know, to get your message out, to protect your reputation, to, 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 to talk with the others, to maintain. In the different studies that I'm looking, um, uh, it's, it's quite interesting because the Russian disinformation for instance, try to plant, you know, distrust between Poland and Ukraine, Poland and the Baltics, and they bring history into play. And they discover that, look, you know, something happening here. We have good relations face to face, but when I looked online, it looked like it's horrible. You know? <laughs> so, uh, uh, so there is a, a, an example of how, you know, uh, it, it flies under the radar, you know, certain things, but you really need to catch up. Now, another pathology that may want to think about is that this prom or pro promise that I mentioned of real time knowing is tricky. It's tricky. Uh, why is it tricky? Because uh, think of what we do during the pandemic. Um, we have access. We don't travel. We don't spend time of commuting. We don't spend time with uh, hotels, with uh, other things. Uh, so we find it's convenient. But at the same time, we have more meetings, right? So it, uh, it, the acceleration is that, you know, I find myself working more now <laughs> on Zoom <laughs> and, and other things than before the pandemic. So you may find that, that you know, this kind of acceleration is such, you know, it, uh, uh, it frees you, but it doesn't. It, uh, uh, the, the more opportunities you have to do things, and this is the speed part, you know, when you bring more technology, the more opportunity to think, actually you do that. So, uh, uh, and that, that, that creates a feedback effect. Uh, um, uh, are, are we able to cope uh, with all of this? Uh, you know, different question that we, we ask, you know, the, the people, the diplomats in our survey, uh, one word that Zoom large, Zoom fatigue. We are fed up. We have too many. Uh, we cannot concentrate. We lose track of what happens. We need AI to monitor, uh, to, to give us summaries of all the meetings. Uh, we need, uh, so uh, it's this kind of, of uh, a little bit of trap that speed pushes us into. Um, so um, just to, to, you know, some, some ruminations on, on, on the idea of how speed can actually uh, shape sensing and also um, our reactions to, to certain events. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, that, that's a good point, really. I mean, on the one hand, um, scientists have reacted to this pandemic with greater speed than ever known before i think you know the speed at which we understood this virus and the uh the vaccines came out in record time and yet at the same time disinformation as you say came out perhaps even faster than the scientists and um overtook uh, and messed up uh, a lot of the that um, ability to have a clear message okay uh, sadly we have come to the end of the time for this webinar um, it has been a really fascinating um, discussion. I want to thank Rebecca and Cornelius again uh, for these uh, very insightful um, looks at their uh, very cutting edge research that they're doing on a brand new phenomenon uh, between digital diplomacy and COVID-19. I have learned a great deal and I would just like to thank you. Uh, uh, thank the audience as well for uh, participating uh, uh, sending in your questions and uh, do note that this video in case you missed anything will be available on the RSIS um, YouTube channel um, in short order. Okay, so thank you very much and goodbye. <laughs>